Welcome to A Fork in Time, the alternate history podcast. Welcome back to A Fork in Time, the Alternate History Podcast. Don sitting in the, uh, the magical what-if machine today, but we're not going to take it anywhere. We're going to ask somebody to climb in and join us. Today, I'm happy to be joined by Andrew Perini. Andrew reached out, uh, I guess, within the last couple of weeks, and we, again, encourage you to go to our website and find out how you can give us feedback and how you can reach out to us. You'll find us there at www.aforkintimepodcast.com. But Andrew actually sent me an email that I prized. The title of his email was, Thanks for Your Inspiration. And when I read the email, Andrew had said that he had uh, found our podcast uh, not that long ago and uh, enjoyed it and by the, did, did something by the way i think that is something of a monumental task andrew i'll talk about that here in a minute once i introduce you a little bit further but you actually went back and picked up the entire back catalog which i've done that with some other podcasts that i've run into but i know that we have about seven days worth of content in doing that so that was no mean feat uh, but andrew said that uh, a fork in time had caused him to go ahead and do something he'd been thinking about doing which was start his own alternate history podcast and as we talk about all the time here on the show, we believe that there's a, a such thing as the alternate history community, and we want to serve that. And so I wanted to reach out to Andrew and ask him to be on the show, tell us a little bit about himself, tell us a little bit about the podcast, and hopefully find uh, some listeners for him, who I know will be some of our listeners and grow the community. So Andrew, thank you for joining me today. And this is the part where I shut up and let you tell the folks a little bit about yourself. All right. Uh, thank you, Don. Thank you for having me on. Uh, you know, like Don said, my name is Andrew Perini. Uh, I host a podcast called Alternate History Class, uh, where I look at alternate history through the lens of a history class from another timeline. Um, this uh, this episode, I, I mean, I guess I should say this season, uh, I'm looking at an alternate timeline where the South won the Civil War um, and just trying to, you know, expand that, you know, for 80, 80 or so years, just kind of looking at how the nations, you know, kind of grow, you know, what what's similar, what's different, you know, and different figures pop up in, in different ways than, you know, you may be, you may be used to. Uh, and then there are people who obviously you know, never really rose to, you know, national prominence who, you know, in us in smaller nations kind of, you know, rise to prominence. And so it's something, you know, it's something I really enjoy doing. I think it, you know, it's really fun. And I try, you know, you know, I, you know, I enjoyed, I've enjoyed alternate history for a long time. And I just tried, wanted to try to bring a little bit of a, of a unique twist to it. I like that as I was, as Andrew and I were talking uh, before we started recording here, uh, I like the fact that he sort of takes it from that, you know, it's a setting, you know, imagine you're in that classroom that's talking about this. I think that that's a good way, you know, it's, it's looking at, all, in this case, obviously the Civil War happened in the past, so you would be looking back, but it's looking back at the present from an alternate future kind of thing, which is, you know, I think an interesting way, way to, way to attack alternate history or counterfactual. So I like the fact that you sort of built a uh, a frame around what you do there. I, I'll be honest, and our listeners that have been around for a while, and Andrew, you certainly fit this category as you've heard it all. We don't always build as good a frame around what we do probably as we should. So I have a tremendous amount of respect for somebody that's got a little bit more of a framework than sometimes what we evolved to here on a fork in time. And I think that that's a benefit for those who are able to do that. Sadly, I'm just not always able to do that because that's not the way my brain always wants to work. Uh, that that's fair enough. Different people do things in different ways, and I don't really think that you know not having quite as solid of a frame has you know done anything to hurt the quality of a fork in time. You know, I I come back to it every every single week. You know, so and I know I know plenty of other people do as well. So. Well, I appreciate that, Andrew. Yeah, it, yeah, in fact, it, it's interesting. We talk, you know, the team, particularly the team that's come to join, as most of our regular listeners will know, 
you know, sometimes we spend a lot of time off podcast doing research because we need to. There are times when it's almost uh, it's the it's the alternate history version of improv sometimes that we slip into. And both of those things can work. Uh, the other thing I was going to say, Andrew, that I, that I really value and we've had other guests on the show and other podcasts that I'm familiar with actually going and not just speculating about the broad what ifs, but in your case, actually building a timeline, which I think is really more the traditional way of thinking about alternate history is uh, that's more challenging too, because you, you actually, you, you're not being ambiguous about it. Well, it could have been this, it could have been that. You have to make a decision about the one thing it's going to be down that alternate path. Yeah. Yeah. And that can be, I mean, there's, there's a lot of freedom in doing that as well. You know, you don't, you don't have to account for every single possible outcome you can you know you're kind of in charge of how this goes right and that will you know and that allows you to to design things and you know if you have a plan in mind for where where things are going uh it can really you know it can help you just get get things done you know in 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 a way that you know make you know as you know as long as you're not going too far off the deep end yeah uh it, you know, it makes sense well it's also i know i know we struggle with and i'm and, and you probably already have i think you're five or six episodes in now if i remember correctly and uh but you know we, we struggle with this all the time here is that uh you know where where is the demarcation between the shallow the medium and the deep end you know it's easy to mm-hmm. that, that that's a subjective thing and, um, and, and, you know, tough thing to figure out there. One of the things we actually talk about very often as we're getting ready to do an episode um, and, you know, and because we bounce around, well, we bounce back to a lot of the same places. There's an island, for example, you know, where people talk a little bit, talk English, but talk a little bit funny that we go back frequently to uh, because of Alexis's uh, love of, of English history and being an Anglophile. But um, it's, you know, we often talk when we're trying to set up our fork of what's a viable fork here. You know, it's uh, what really, really could have happened, not just some ridiculous thing. And what happens there is you continue to go down those paths. You have to continue to sort of judge the viability of stuff. And that, yeah, that's where it gets tricky. And I've listened to a couple of of Andrew's episodes. I think he does a good job of that, of, you know, trying to find what is within the realm of, you know, sometimes it may be on the edge of the possible, but within the realm of the possible, if not the probable, if you change an event. Yeah, well, th- thank you, Don. You know, I I do work hard on trying to make sure that, you know, thing I don't let things just go completely off the deep end one way one way or the other. You know, yeah. you know, I don't want things to have look. You know, I don't want things to look in 1900 the same way that they do in in 1860 because you know people will have changed, times would have changed uh, right. for everybody in the in that world. I mean, in one of my more recent episodes, you know, I talk about uh, prohibition uh, in the South um, arising because of, you know, people viewing it as a, you know, as a way of repenting for a, for a sin, for something that they, I'm trying not to, you know, I'm talking around trying not to spoil (laughs) what, what goes on down the line, but, you know, for, for something that, they view as a national travesty, um, you know. It, when when in our timeline, uh, that that is not how prohibition, ten, you know, naturally kind of arose in the yeah. country. And and yet, even if you have prohibition, but you have it in a different context, it has different outputs, right? Different different impacts, yeah. and you know that that to me is what I've always been drawn to. Um, Thinking about alternate history and counterfactual, we were talking off podcast. I think the first book that you have is actually one that I can literally look across here and see on my shelf, which is a collection of essays or writings called What If. And I have What If and What If 2 sitting right next to each other there. But, you know, uh, there's, you know, the thing I remember about that was, you know, my other first exposure to uh, to alternate history was um, was fictional in the case of Harry Turtle Dove's Guns of the South. Mm-hmm. And, you know, What If and guns of the south are both doing a similar thing you know it, it's it's the what if scenario of what could have happened but one of them is taking it with historians you know writing from a very serious sort of bin which is what those what if essays are in that book you know versus a, a fictional writer like turtle dove who i've seen interviewed a number of times who has a lot more freedom he's doing the same thing but he's doing it a different way and that's why you know different strokes for different folks 
yeah, yeah. And it's, you know, and different people enjoy, you know, different people enjoy the different types of, of alternate history. Some people enjoy that, you know, more serious style that, that What If has. And other people, you know, tend to enjoy the more narrative, uh, character-driven kind of stuff that, that Turtle Duff puts out there. Yeah. And, and uh, again, I, I think that I think there's a place for both of them, which is why we've said all along, you know, we don't view anybody else like you who's starting a podcast as being the competition. You're just growing the community and appealing maybe to a different part of the community than we do. There's probably over, you know, if this if the alternate history community is a Venn diagram, there's going to be overlap. Mm-hmm. Uh, there's going to be, you know, there's going to be things that are, that are in the individual circles. That's just the way that it's going to be. But, uh, both of those things are good. Uh, so around the structure of your show, I know you're in your first season here now, if I understand correctly from the way you laid out in the trailer, by the way, let me just go ahead and tell our listeners this. If you stay listening to this episode, (laughs) uh, Andrew has kindly enough agreed to let me do a wrapper around his trailer and his first episode. Uh, so you can get a jump start on, uh, on listening to his trailer and his first episode just by, after we're done talking here on this episode, you will hear those things. That doesn't mean that you're not supposed to go find his podcast, which the information will be in the show notes about, link to it and subscribe to it. That's not everything. There's more to come. And, uh, we're just doing that to give an introduction to our audience to the podcast, and, grac- and Andrew's graciously allowed that. By the way, he won't see those downloads in his count, so uh, I want to say that. You, in fact, in fact, if you do that, go and listen to it again directly on him, so we know that you did, but or at least send him a note. But, but if you stay tuned, you'll hear that. But I understand your structure, Andrew, is going to be the seasons are going to be like are, are going to be arcs here. The first one happens to be this uh, Civil War inspired arc, but. If you move on to future seasons, you intend to do that same sort of format, just with different times, right? Yeah, that w- that's that's the idea I've had, you know. And one one thing I've been thinking about, you know, what would what would season two be? Because you know, I don't want to finish season one and have absolutely no idea what <laughs> I'm going to do uh, afterwards. So uh, I'm thinking about you know different endings to like the the one that's been most prominently in my mind is different endings to like the Cold War, uh, oh, okay. for example, and you know that and that might change the the show's format just a little bit. But you know you know again it's something that's working in my you know I've been working through in my head. You know I haven't I haven't actually committed to anything, and I would be you know interested in ideas that other people have from the yeah. community. I, I, I think I, I also admire, I was telling, uh, telling Andrew before we started here, first of all, I admire the fact that, you know, it is and probably will continue to be a solo effort. I've done solo shows for Fork in Time, and um, I know the challenge of that. It's, uh, it's uh, that's a challenging thing. But I definitely do like the continuity that comes from having an arc structure. You know, we've done some series here on our show. Uh, for that very reason but i think that there's there's a lot of value to that and the other thing i think i was mentioning maybe we mentioned already in the interview here was this idea of actually putting a real structured timeline to what you're doing so as you go through that alternate path after the point of departure it's not what we often do here on a fork in time which i think is an okay thing to do so well maybe it's this or maybe it's that you know discuss in your case you have to make a choice there about well I made the choice that the deflection produced this. Now I'm going to talk about that. That's a little bit different as we talked about, Andrew. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, while there, while there is some comfort in knowing that, you know, it's your choice, you know, you don't really have to take in anything else into account. You know, at the same time, there's a, there's a little bit of worry there. It's like, well, I mean, it's just me doing this. Maybe I can miss something or, you know, sometimes, you know, when I'm looking up people like, to run in presidential elections in a, in a fictional confederacy. You know, I have to just look up, I, you know, you know, it's com- coming up with those people because I like to use real people mm-hmm. instead of just making up, making up somebody, you know. And, and, and I've, I've, for example, Brent Frost, who was an early guest on our show, I think one of, the, one of our episodes, I think, was, was basically just a presentation of his timeline, a, a timeline mm-hmm. that he had put together. And uh, I, th- I think what you do there th- is, is the good thing to do. You know, let's don't create a fictional person where I can make that person whatever I need them to be. But I'm going to take someone you already know, but I'm going to twist it a little bit based upon what's changed so that you have both the familiar and the non-familiar at the same time. 
And yeah. uh, I, I think that actually lends value. I think that's something that makes it easier for listeners to connect to, just in my opinion. I know for me, when I listen to things like that, it's easier for me to connect to that. Oh, yeah, I know who that guy is. Oh, but this is a different set of circumstances. How, do, how does that work? How does he work or she work, you know, in that set of circumstances? Yeah. And, you know, sometimes when you're looking for people who you're not going to, you know, bring on further down the road, they're just kind of there um, for to to lose a presidential election or something like that. You know, I in, in my Google search history, I just have lists of so such and such states governors um, yeah. to so that I'm using, you know, real people. And I kind of look at, you know, kind of what they stand you know, what they stood for in, in real life and see if, you know, I guess that would make sense, you know, for them to run in this fictional party I've created, you know, this point at this point in a fictional timeline. Yeah, I think I think that's a I think that's a good tool or a good technique. And, and in some cases, you get to elevate somebody there that may be, you know, known in that state's history, a listener in that state may know them, but it's a, a figure that it's a real historical figure that may not be widely known, but you didn't invent them out of whole cloth. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, you know, I think it adds a little bit of, you know, a little bit of texture to the world. And, you know, maybe everyone, you know, maybe at some point, you know, once the, once the show starts to pick up, I'll start to hear back from people who are, you know, historians of their specific state. Like, I don't, I didn't think anybody else would ever bring this person up again kind of thing you know yeah. it's the you know it's finding that one or two per people who could connect to that that, that point yeah I, I i appreciate that and one, one of the things i've enjoyed the most as i was telling andrew when we were because he's hosting on the same platform that we are is uh you know you can see how many downloads you're getting for particular episodes or a particular day mm-hmm. the and the cool thing there is the map that gets generated knowing where people are listening from which is also sort of cool and uh, but you know you never know yeah you know, the interesting thing there is they're just they're just numbers on a screen until they become people <laughs> so it's you know it's you know, you know how's that resonating with that you know that that i don't know if it's a guy or a gal in tennessee or you know who is this person in norway <laughs> that's listening yeah. to me you know kind of thing and you know, do, they, do they get it for example do they get that reference in the same way you know that i get that reference and uh, you sort of get you sort of get this direct feedback because you know we got that very early on and i appreciate it i know that andrew will start seeing that more uh but then you also get this indirect feedback of okay you know the, 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 they must be understanding it well enough because apparently they're coming back every week which is pretty cool mm-hmm. so andrew tell our listeners where they I, I know you're not even listed in all of the um all of the um various pod catchers and pod directories yet the biggest one you're missing yet is apple so that'd be a little bit trickier for people to find you if they're normally using apple too how can people find alternate history class other other than what i'm going to put in the show notes which should be a big help by the way (laughs) yeah um well yeah and again i appreciate that um the biggest platform that i'm on is is spotify and i'm on a, a lot of smaller um you know, podcast, you know, uh, the, the hosting platform we use, uh, just, you know, it has a whole wide variety of things that I don't even remember. I mean, I remember, for example, that I'm on, on Amazon music. Um, but I don't remember all the, the small, uh, small podcast, uh, catchers that I'm on off the top of my head at least you yeah know, but the, 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 by the way the link that i will put in the show notes will be directly to the buzzsprout which is who we both use to host uh, will be directly to the buzzsprout website for the podcast and the reason i do that is that's how the other sites ultimately pick it up is off of that rss feed so i know that if i put that in the show notes that's going to go to the source. I know you're going to be able to get it there all the time. So for listeners, you know, you should be able to click on that. There should be a place for you to load an RSS feed into your pod catcher of choice uh, until it's available on, you know, uh, Apple. I guess they're calling that Apple. I don't know what Apple's calling it this week. They seem to change every week, but on Apple podcasts or on Google play or any of the places like that. I'm sorry, you mm-hmm. interrupt you. No, no, that's all right. I was kind of, you know, winding down there you know sometimes when i'm allowed to talk by myself i tend to <laughs> tend to ramble um 
you know, especially when I'm talking about something that I don't get to talk to a lot of people about. Usually my mom gets the the majority of the ramblings about the podcast. <laughs> See, now the, the joy of having a podcast is you're able to record your ramblings and share with others. That's that's what I did. So uh, so there you go. Well, Andrew, uh, anything else you want to mention to the folks? Anything you want to ask of me? Just anything else before we sort of uh, uh, let people stop listening to us talk and let them get on to the fact that if they stick with it, they'll be able to hear your first episode here? Um, no, just... You know, thank you. You know, thank you all for you know tuning in, and I, I hope you enjoy you enjoy the trailer in the in the first episode, which you know isn't itself. I should point out isn't itself alternate history. That's right. Your first episode uh, actually is, is your history. is your is your setup episode. That's right. Yeah, yeah. The first episode, you know, and that's kind of the structure I'm kind of looking to do for for future seasons too. The first episode will kind of be a setup, you know, kind of what really happened. Yeah. And then if you want the alternate history, you have to go over. Then you'll have to go. See, to see what we, we, we left them as a cliffhanger there. See, it works out pretty well when we do it that way. So, uh, yeah, you know, Alexis and I talked about that a number of times in the early part of the show. It's like, man, we spent a lot of time talking about because the what did was fascinating. <laughs> Before we even got yeah. into the what if, you know, the what did was pretty fascinating. And we discovered, you know, that little trap of you have to normally set up the what did to some degree because you don't want to assume that everybody is coming from the same place or starting at the same place on the what did, but uh, you have to do the what did before the what if. And so I think that's a good format to use. So again, what you'll hear here is the introduction that really is the what did to the greatest degree. And then you have to go and follow the links to get the rest of the feed to hear the rest of it. Andrew, I appreciate you joining me today. Uh, we did this on pretty short notice. So I also pre appreciate that as well. Again, for our listeners, uh, this is the last time I say this, in the show notes, you'll find where to find the podcast. I'll also go ahead and bring over some of the information that I know Andrew has on his show notes, which is how to get in touch with him, uh, how to support him on his Patreon page, all the things that go with that. So I'll make sure that we include all of that in the show notes here so it's easy to access that as well. And we've already talked about we're going to have Andrew back on at some point to join the rest of the uh, Fork in Time slash Room Where It Happened team. And uh, he'll join us in a discussion of whatever topic we're doing that day that might be of interest to him. So uh, you'll hear Andrew again, not only if you go and become a listener to his podcast, which we encourage, but also if you uh, continue to be a listener to ours. So Andrew, again, thanks and good luck and welcome to the community. And uh, we look forward to, to working alongside you. This is, we, we think we're doing yeoman's work here, so we want to keep doing it. Well, thank you. Thank you, Don. I, I, really, appre I really appreciate it. All right. And for our listeners, stay tuned. Uh, you'll hear a little bit of the interlude here, but then it'll jump directly in uh, to Andrew's uh, theme music for his trailer and from the trailer directly into the uh, to the episode. So we hope you enjoy that. Hello, and welcome to the Alternate History Class Podcast, where I explore alternate history through the lens of a history class from another timeline. The first episode of each season will explore what really happened, while the rest will look at what may have happened in the following decades, and maybe even centuries, if things had gone differently. I hope you'll join me as we journey down the path not taken. Hello, and welcome to the Alternate History Class Podcast. My name's Andrew, and here I explore alternate history through the lens of a history class from another timeline. In this week's episode, we'll explore the background of our point 
departure, the Battle of Antietam, why it was so important, and how the American Civil War began to swing towards the Union on the 8th of May, in September 1862. Slavery is often called America's original sin, and for a good reason. From the arrival of the first slaves aboard the White Lion to the Virginia Colony in 1619, up until they gained their independence, slavery was common across the British colonies that made up the United States. Slavery would also be a major divisive issue that drove much of politics for the first 80 or so years of the new nation's history. The South, being a very agricultural and rural part of the nation, used slavery much more than it was used in the North. And when industrialization came along, the North started to view slavery as an issue of the past, something that the nation could move on from. As they started putting factories for textiles and other manufactured goods throughout that region of the country. The South, on the other hand, did not embrace this new wave of industrialization, preferring to stay with its more agriculture-based society. This made slavery a regional issue, and as northern states became to become more and more opposed to slavery, and southern states became more and more defensive of it, the debate around it became much more heated and divisive to the point at which the nation would end up going to war with itself upon the election of a relatively anti-slavery candidate in Abraham Lincoln. Now, contrary to popular belief, Abraham Lincoln did not want to abolish slavery, or at least he did not campaign on it. He wanted to contain slavery within the states where it was already legal, and not allow it to expand. But the South viewed this as an existential threat. If they allowed this to happen, a constitutional amendment could be passed in the future that would abolish slavery and take away a large portion of the South's power. This led the South to declare independence to secede from the Union, starting with South Carolina and moving further and further along until most of the Deep South had joined in. Then after the first shots were fired at Fort Sumter in South Carolina, several more states joined, including Virginia, which would become a very central and key state where much of the following civil war would be fought. This civil war would start off going very poorly for the North, which, if you look back at it, it seems preposterous. The North had far more men, far more resources, and far more factories, along with more transportation. They had the infrastructure to win a war. But what the South had that the North didn't was tactically superior generals. Many of the United States' best generals had, for one way way or another, come from the South, including the man that Lincoln was advised to put in charge 
of the Armed Forces by the current Chief of Staff, Winfield Scott. And that would be one Robert E. Lee. Robert E. Lee was a very tactically minded general. He understood how to use his resources to the best of his advantage. And that gave him much of an advantage in the early stages of the war, while the Union tried to find a general that would better fit their tactics. The most prominent of the early generals that the Union had was a man by the name of George McClellan. Now, George McClellan is well regarded as a man who could train and prepare an army to become a well-structured fighting force. But he, see, but he was also a very cautious general when it came to battle. He did not want to engage the enemy unless he was 100% sure he would win. This led to disastrous early campaigns, which caused him to lose command eventually. But he was given back command of the primary Union Army, the Army of the Potomac, and went on in early 1862 to fight a disastrous campaign known as the Peninsular Campaign, uh, in which he was outdone by Southern tactics in Southern information. Uh, he was deceived several times into thinking he was outnumbered or didn't have nearly enough men to do the job, at least in his eyes. Uh, this ended up leading to him getting driven back to Maryland, the Washington, D.C. area. This is when Lee decided it was the time to go on the offensive, as he had chosen to side with his home state of Virginia and was given command of the Army of Northern Virginia, which would become the premier army of the Confederacy. Lee decided that the best way for the Confederacy to win the war would be to strike at northern morale and invade the north. Lee was taking advantage of dissent among the ranks of the Union Army and issued Special Order 191, which detailed plans to push into the newly proclaimed state of West Virginia and Maryland, from which he would then could potentially stage an attack on the north. Now, as he as Lee started to send his men out through these orders to start to take towns, uh, including Harper's Ferry, um, the site of the infamous or famous, depending on how you look at it, uh, raid by John Brown only a few years earlier. But McClellan had gotten word that Lee was making moves and wanted to position his army better to be able to respond to it. And after Lee's army abandoned their campsite around Frederick, Maryland, McClellan's army moved in. What happened next would change the course of the war. Private Barton W. Mitchell and Sergeant John M. Bloss found a copy of Special Order 191 with detailed Confederate troop movements allegedly wrapped around three cigars. This made McClellan enthused. He immediately began to move his army now that he had the upper hand. But as soon as Lee heard that he had lost a copy, 
of Special Order 191, he assumed the worst and began to reunite his units near the Maryland town of Sharpsburg. It was here where the single bloodiest day of the American Civil War would take place. The battle itself, known as the Battle of Sharpsburg, but more commonly known as the Battle of Antietam, began at dawn on September 17th, as the fog lifted. Lee's troops, having been rushed together, were worn out, hungry, and many were sick. The battle would be incredibly bloody and incredibly brutal from the fighting on both sides. It would result in total around 23,000 casualties, including an estimated 3,650 dead in total. This is the single bloodiest day of the American Civil War. While later battles would go on to be bloodier, no other single day was ever as bloody as the single day the Battle of Antietam was. With the hits to his troops, we knew he could not fight another day and retreated back into Virginia. McClellan, to the rage and frustration of President Lincoln, refused to follow Lee. Lincoln would continuously order McClellan to pursue Lee to kick the Army of Northern Virginia while it was down, and, a move, and if they could crush them significantly, it could all but end the war. But McClellan refused. McClellan was a war-weary man, but he was also a very proud man. And his refusal to pursue Lee caused him to be removed from, from command of the Army of the Potomac on November 5th, 1862. Now this battle holds a great amount of significance because not, not just what happened, the stopping of an invasion of the North by Lee, but also what would come after. The Union would declare this a victory, although most military historians consider the battle tactically to be a stalemate. With this victory, or the closest thing the Union really had to a victory, in the war, Abraham Lincoln released the Emancipation Proclamation on September 22, 1862. This document declared all slaves in rebellious states to be considered free according to the Union. This had a dual effect. One, it ramped up the support of the abolitionists and uh, the rather demoralized North, but also guaranteed that France and Britain would not join the war. Now, we haven't mentioned France and Britain yet, but the reason France and Britain were watching this war carefully was because at this time, they were getting the majority of their cotton from the southern United States, from those states that were rebelling. And there were rumors that the British and French were looking to potentially support 
President Jefferson Davis of the Confederacy and pressure the United States into recognizing the nation to get cotton flow back up. Britain and France had long abolished slavery and did not want to be viewed as supporting the act of slavery as the Union had now made this war, not just about defending the unity of the nation, but about freeing the slaves in the rebellious states and ending slavery. The British and French would turn to find other sources of cotton, and the United States would eventually find their general, a general willing to utilize the superior manpower of the North to his full advantage on Ulysses S. Grant, who was given control of the Army of the Potomac after much success in the West, where he helped capture the town of Vicksburg, which essentially cut the Confederacy in two along the Mississippi River and won many, many of the Union's early battles. Grant's aggressiveness was labeled by his critics as butchery, but was exactly what Abraham Lincoln was looking for to, when it came to fighting Lee. Grant would continue to bash Lee over and over again until eventually Lee surrendered at Appomattox Courthouse in 1865, which essentially ended the American Civil War. There was some fighting that needed to be cleaned up. But the Union had won. What if things had gone differently? What if the person who dropped those cigars had made sure he had them in the order that they were wrapped in? What if Lee was able to use the element of surprise to his advantage and pull off a daring invasion of the North? How differently would things have gone? That is what we will explore the rest of this season. Because I believe that things would have gone very, very differently. Thanks for listening to A Fork in Time, the alternate history podcast. Learn more and provide feedback by visiting our website at www.aforkintimepodcast.com. Connect to us on Facebook at facebook.com forward slash aforkintime or follow us on Twitter at A-F-I-T podcast. If you want to support the show financially, visit our Patreon page at patreon.com forward slash a fork in time. We hope you will join us next time.